Summer Live. We're back. This is the Coverager Podcast. My name is Nick Lamparelli, and it is a late afternoon, and we're going to be talking about data and analytics and children's books. <laughs> stay, stay with us. Don't you dare leave. Um, Serena Marie Arnold, thank you so much for joining us, um, or joining us, joining me. Thanks for coming on. Um, uh, hopefully the power stays on. So mm -hmm. you never you know. know. You're a meteorologist. You should have predicted this. I know, right? Tell me about it. I know we've got some rain moving in. I live in a real finicky area where if the wind blows like right at 256 degrees, apparently we lose power. So the generator's running. I think we're in good shape. Okay. So uh, that's a good segue because we're going to be uh, spending this episode talking about data in analytics and talking about um, those that consume data and analytics and those that provide it and basically what should that relationship look like you know how how can you how can both sides maximize that particular relationship to make it successful and so we have just the right person for that so uh, Serena I'm gonna give you a little bit of a soapbox here uh, who are you who do you work for and, uh, you know, talk, talk a little bit about that. And, and don't forget to mention that you're an author. <laughs> <laughs> You're really rubbing in that teaser. I really like it. So uh, I am Serena Arnold. I'm the Vice President of Customer Success with Athenium Analytics. And I actually started out as a meteorologist. So that's my background. I've done everything from storm chasing and hurricane chasing to working with NASA contractors and installing weather stations on the remote Alaska tundra. So doing installations and quality assurance on the data. And then I went to the uh, home of the world's worst weather, the Mount Washington Observatory where I was a director of operations there and got to do some more crazy weather data collection and then decided maybe I should settle down and get an office job and that's where I joined what was at the time weather analytics and I joined as a uh, director of product sciences and my role was basically as a translator so how can I take these really hard meteorological concepts and translate them in a way to where other people can understand them. So we had, you know, some weather product offerings still do where we can help with underwriting and claims verification. And so being able to explain the weather behind it in a way that anybody could understand was kind of my gift and what I did. And so fast forward now to five years later, and I'm the vice president of customer success with the company. Um, we've acquired Athenium. We now have quality assurance products. And so overseeing the account manager team for the entire company. Um, so getting to see how data is used a lot. Yeah, yeah. and, and it's, it's right in your title, right? Like, so um, I, I think, um, so for those that have followed my career in my podcast, and they know that I've already interviewed you, um, on another channel um, and but what I think what precipitated this particular conversation was I saw you on another interview um, there were like a whole bunch of you nerdy meteorologists talking about stuff and guys really like geeking into it but you you talked about that translation thing and I said oh you know I, I really should invite you back on because you um, you have a nice way of knowing like the deep technical issues, but also how how to communicate that and success is in your title, right? And so you're be, you're essentially getting paid to make sure that whoever is purchasing or using that data or that analytics that they're using it in the right way. And so it's a, I, I think it's a I think a perfect way for a lot of folks that. It, regardless of, they don't have to be in, even in weather. It's just, um, you know, solution providers and solution, con, you know, p uh, companies that have solution. How should they be interacting? So I wanted to bring the world's best expert on that. <laughs> well, that's really great. I mean, just yeah, that's, that's quite the compliment. Thank you. And it is, it's wonderful to be back again. Okay. So um, since we've talked, since we've seen each other, uh, the world has been flipped upside down. Oh, and shaken. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if you know that, but. <laughs> like everything has changed. We have a new normal. And so I was wondering if you could sort of talk about the last few months. Um, and, and you deal a lot, you deal with uh, companies outside of insurance as well. So just um, basically, you know, companies uh, that require your data, your analytics, but also for you, uh, what are you, what have you seen um, in terms of the, 
uh, the atmosphere, the environment um, that's going on in in the space that requires very sensitive technical data? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think like all of us right now who are trying to get by, everyone's in survival mode. You know, we are at home while trying to work and do our same job with kids, you know, being at home with us now nonstop. Um, every organization is going through the same thing. They're saying the same things with their teams and they're actually trying to do the same thing from a business perspective. So whether it's, you know, trying to make sure that they're spending less um, or being more efficient with their spending, maybe you need to spend more in some other places, right? It's all about survival right now. It's what is working for us and what is not working for us. What do we need to do more of because we're finding that it's very helpful? What do we need to be doing less of because of it, it's not? Um, everyone is, is very much out there in, in survival mode. And I think um, it's really important to be able to move today. I think you're going to have to be in survival mode. I think agility and flexibility is going to be the key to success because I mean, if you listen to the experts, this isn't going to be over tomorrow, right? So mm -hmm. I think we've got to look forward to at least another, you know, six months-ish or at least of what's going on now. And then there's going to be a recovery time period. So if you can be agile and flexible and really take a serious look, um, you know, those are the changes that we're seeing with companies. So some things are being pared back and some things are being scaled up depending on how they're working for those organizations. Have you, have you seen anyone put, put the foot on the throttle? and just say, I, I, everyone else is in survival mode, this is an opportunity for us. A little bit. You know, the only ones that I've seen that have been able to do that a little bit, a little bit of the throttle, are the organizations that have are probably the most forward thinking, you know, that top 5% of our customer base. They've already been there. They're two steps ahead of this. They've had people working remotely for years, you know, their entire customer, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of their employees. Either that or they've trained for this and prepared for this over and over again. Those that are more prepared now are the ones that can afford to take that additional step, that can um, can do things that others can't, where everyone's sort of waiting in survival mode. So it's um, the only ones that are are the ones that have been leading that innovation charge, and, and I mean, like at, at the top of the list. Yeah. So let's talk about um, the interaction. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I think to start, I think I, I would like to focus on that top 5%, the forward looking ones, because I want, um, I want others to sort of see like how, um, how a successful pairing, um, successful partnership can work. And so can you talk about a little bit about, um, with those companies, like what's been over time, what's been the give or take, um, how, how have they been successful and how have you um, or, you know, organization like, organizations like yours been able to sort of um, develop a cadence with them so, they, so that both of you can be successful? Yeah. Um, is it cheesy to say communication? <laughs> That's a really, really big part of it is um, completely communicating and understand what's going on. You know, we try to check in with people on a quarterly basis and have some customers that make that a priority for them as well to check in with us quarterly. I think that's really, really important. We need to know how each other are evolving. What yeah. is our game plan and having a long term plan. So talking about that five top 5% 5 right now, when I think about some of their common characteristics, it's budgeting that's out and done for the next three years. Um, you know, despite this, this environment, it's um, knowing where they're going and, and they're solid in it. It's not, well, we're going to try this. It's, this is the direction that we're headed in and we are all in. Um, and it's, a, you know, typically a very innovative direction. Um, they're very sure of themselves. You know, there's, there's a confidence to what they're doing. They, they've got people on board that are just, very, very savvy and know how to, to weather these type of markets. Um, so that, I think those are really the, the common characteristics that we're seeing within our customer base for, for that right now. Yeah. You, you said the word all in and I can, I know from personal experience being on the other side, right. Where, um, where you, you find these companies that are doing a lot of tire kicking, right. And mm -hmm. it almost never works. Right, like it, 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 I know, I know you need to have a little tire kicking, but it's almost they're almost admitting like they can't go all in. They they just don't have the um, they don't have the guts uh, to do that for for whatever reason. You, you know, it could be it could be a whole set of a whole set of reasons. So, um, talk about companies that are outside the top five percent. 
Okay. Right. And like, th like those ones that like the one I, uh, I have some experience with where they couldn't pull the trigger in a meaningful way. So it was a lot of tire kicking and, um, let's assume that they recognize that I'm pointing the finger at them on this conversation. So yeah, Acknowledgement's you. Acknowledgement's the first step of the process, yeah, right? Yeah, you. <laughs> like, like, okay, you have the problem. You, you yeah. have a budget and, you know, you're just, you're just sitting there struggling. Like, I want to be in the top 5%, but I'm, I'm afraid to commit to anything that that's, that's big. And so I'm going to do these like little piecemeal stuff and, um, Walk us through that. Well, you must have some experience with companies that were once like that and you sort of get over the hump. Mm -hmm. what, what do you have to do to get over the hump? How do people who approach their, like a diet, like a New Year's resolution diet that take that same approach to it, how well do they yeah. do? Okay, Terrible. you don't you don't do very well. Yeah. So what you need to think about is the end goal. You need to think about what business objective are we achieving by doing this, um, you know, and what can be our measure of success. I think if you don't define some of those things, you're keeping yourself in this like wishy washy land. So yeah. you need to be able to say what success is, what success looks like, and and make it very clear. And it needs to be a measurable thing. It's so easy to define failure. You know, you know, it, it for some reason it varies. But it's very hard to define success. So what is your metric? What is, it, what is success? It needs to be something that is measurable, first of all. It needs to have, you know, a date to it and you need to commit to it and put it in writing. If you're wishy-washy and you're kicking the tire, I understand that. I mean, we're talking about some of the most risk-averse groups and organizations that are yep. out there. That's the business. That's the whole point. Yep. So doing this at times can be really, really scary. But if you've, if you've looked at it and to like your diet, right? And it's not like I want to get in better shape, right? I want to have a better company. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen because that is not a goal. That's not something that's achievable and that's not something that's measurable. But if you say, I want to increase profits by X, I want to, you know, decrease losses by Y, by X date, I want to see this metric. Now you're talking something, you know, and now you're getting better. Now you can break that down. Well, what do I need to do every month to reach that? What do I need to do every week, every day, right? So it's just like looking at your diet. It's not that, you know, I'm going to get in better shape and that's it. It's I'm going to try to run five miles a week. I'm going to try not to have more than 2,000 calories a day or something like that. They need to be these small measurable goals. And I think we need to remember too for the risk averseness that done is better than perfect, it's never going to be perfect. No. Um, and, you know, that's a lesson that I've learned recently. Um, we can, we'll talk about that with the whole book thing even a little bit later. You, you reach a point where sometimes you just have to go. You've got to commit. If you're, you know, standing at the edge of a diving board and, and you start overthinking it, well, I could flip over, I could land on my back, I could belly flop, I could, you know, you're not going to do it if you think of everything that's going to go wrong. Sometimes you just have to jump. Um, and it may not be perfect. I'm not expecting, you know, a 10 out of a 10 rated dive off the diving board. But do it because doing it sometimes is better than not doing it all. And you could just kick the yeah. tire forever. And next thing you know, a year has gone by and you're in the exact same position you were before with no improvement. So let's, let's bounce back to the top 5% again. Mm -hmm. um, explain the dynamic of your relationship with them. Um, you know, it, so the top 5%, it could be, I'm envisioning, it could be like this magical, you know, um, Hey, you helped us. And, uh, can you help us with this? And then like, there's this like beautiful cadence of, you know, you helping them and them, you know, giving you feedback or it could be, they could be in the top 5% because they're tough and, you know, we cut a good deal and, you know, we're, you know, really or we're smart business people. Um, talk about what the, what the dynamic is like and how, how they sort of think through all of those different things. I, I'm guessing, I, I'm, by your prior answer, I'm already guessing that you're going to say they measure everything. And, but I'm, I'm thinking more of like the dynamic between solution provider and them, mm -hmm. like back and forth. Like how honest can you be with them? Very. 
You have to be. It's a partnership. The ones that it works with, you are a partnership. It's not a vendor client relationship. You know, it's not, that's, it's just not that. That's gross, actually, if you want to know the truth. It's a partnership. It's us saying, what are your business needs? Because we genuinely care what those are. Having us understand them and say, we think we can do X, Y, and Z to help you. Then they, they try it out and they come back, well, this works or this didn't work. And it's constant communication. Um, and so it's, it's having that real spirit of partnership. It's not being afraid to say, that was a really bad project, or that didn't go the way that we had expected. It needs to be that open communication, you know, all those things you probably hear like a therapist say, all of those types of things. We have to be honest with each other. We have to be able to say that worked and that didn't. It, you, it truly needs to be like, like a real partnership. It, it can't be that client-vendor yeah. type of relationship. And yeah, there's measuring and stuff like that that's going along the way too. Um, partnership really yeah. just a, a, a true partner and but and, and that means as well um treating the vendor um in a particular way right so it's a, if it's a true partnership they'll know that hey you know uh, there needs to be a win-win on both sides and um i think for for some folks that might be listening to this that's a that's a hard conversation to have because it's like you know we need to get paid too you know we're bringing something of value um, you know, how, how have you sort of approached or broached that particular subject? Because that, that's probably the most difficult one for a lot of solution providers to have. It is, but if you want to get better, it's a really necessary conversation. You need to be able to open the door and say, hey, what can I be doing better? What has worked and what hasn't worked? And by asking this question, it's really amazing some of the answers that I've had customers give us. One of the, my favorite ones I ever got, um, you know, and it's a tough place to put you, like it's a vulnerable position, yeah, right? To yeah. be like, what can I do better? You know, and you're like, please don't destroy me. Okay, but this is what we have to do. One of my favorite ones we asked and they said, you know what? One of the reports that you give us when we PDF it and print it, the whole last back page is all solid blue. And every time I print one of your reports, I drain an entire cartridge of ink. If you could just make that last page white, it would make my life so much easier. My jaw hit the floor. I'm sitting here waiting for a, a data change that we can make or some algorithms not working. And they want us to change the color of a page of a report that literally takes like three clicks of a button. Yep. But that was a pain point for them. That was something that drove them nuts that they're not going to mention otherwise. And to be able to say, yeah, we can fix that. And we fixed it same day and it was done. What does that do for a partnership, right? Yeah. So that was, a, that was a good thing. It wasn't you know, something that you know, we've done personally. It was just something we can improve. We also have a client, one of my, my favorite clients that we work with, they schedule quarterly reviews with us and they go through and the, you know, the entire team grades us on a report card and we see how we do semester to semester and see where we're improving and where things are getting bad. Um, and we've had to have a couple conversations. Hey, we think the responsiveness of our customer support has really slipped recently. You know, we've got a new person here um, and we're just not jiving with them very well right now. None of that's personal. That's, that's in the spirit of partnership. That's coming to you saying, I value what you bring to us. I value mm -hmm. what we're, you're using here and we want to make it a little bit better. We see longevity here and we want to keep satisfaction high. And you have to remember that from like an account management perspective, rule number one is satisfaction. The customer's not happy with what you're using. They're not going to keep it. They're not going to expand. I mean, eventually we are hoping, like you talked a little bit about later, in the spirit of partnership, we want customers to be able to come to us for everything if they have a question, even if they have to say, if we have to say no. So, hey, can you guys do this? Oh, no, sorry, we can't. They came to us first. That shows that there's, you know, a truth trust. in that partnership. There's yeah. major trust, right? Mm -hmm. That's, these things are huge. Um, yep. So, you know, we for our partner customers and for all our customers, really, we want to be like their Amazon. You know how when you're searching for something, you like go to Amazon first and it's like, ah, you know, it's not just books anymore. Or you can buy anything on Amazon. We need to be the same thing. And that's if a true partner wants to be that as a vendor, they need to. And it takes asking those difficult questions. It takes vulnerability. It takes putting yourself out there yeah. and saying, here I am. I'm open to feedback. What could I do better? And almost every time there's nothing in there that's going to be personal and it's just going to make you better. Yep. 
I, I had an experience in uh, a firm that I worked with. Uh, we were we were visiting one of our largest clients. So this is definitively like a seven figure account. So extremely important. And um, the person on the other end brought in a very large stack of papers, which is always makes you go gulp. You know, like, <laughs> oh, what's this? Um, and she painstakingly went through item after item of where we kind of fell down. Um, and, but the, so that wasn't personal. That was, you know, she kind of went through it and then she kind of hit us with the big one, which is, you know, um, every time you guys update your software, this is, I'm, we're going to walk you through what we have to do. And it was like taking an entire production set of servers offline to update the software to then test it. It was basically they were out of commission for 24 to 48 hours because of the software up update. And it was, I agree with you, like it was not personal. Um, and actually the person who was delivering it was very uncomfortable delivering it. Her face was very red. She, uh, you know, was the Midwest, so they're very nice people. And she didn't like giving such negative feedback, but there were three of us and we ate it up. We were just like scribbling notes because we went back and it's just like, holy crap, mm -hmm. right? Like the, we had no idea this was like such a big problem and we meet immediately set to fix it. And I remember when they were like uh, negotiating like one of the uh, forward contracts um, after that, where it sort of came up like, yeah, you you guys are, you guys have nailed it. Like customer service and all of that. So it makes a huge difference, right? Oh, you know? It does. I mean, and that just goes to show you like there, it is uncomfortable for them. It's probably more uncomfortable for them than for you because they don't want to damage the relationship. Right. I mean, it's like sitting down with your spouse and being like, Hey, we need to talk. Okay. That's a really hard conversation to have. So, I mean, the fact that they're bringing that to you, this is an awesome opportunity as yeah. a vendor to earn more trust and to say like, I'm listening to you. I hear what you're saying. I get why that's a pain point. I understand why that affects your business business. Let me, you know, relieve you of that. You know, thank you for telling me. And you should, if you're doing things right, you should be really grateful that they've come to you with that because how yeah. nice to know that's a really easy fix in the grand scheme of things. Well, also if they're having that problem, others are having that problem. Everybody like, is then, you and, know, and they're not going to tell you. So what, look at how that's much the more worst. they value, they value your, that partnership and that relationship more than any of the other customers because they came to you. And that's a really hard perspective to maintain in your head is that they came to you because they care. They're not trying to have this difficult conversation to make you uncomfortable or to insult you. They've brought it to your attention because they care yeah. more so than anybody else. That's valuable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, it's, uh, it's uncomfortable when you're on the other side. But I think over time, like I learned to um, accept it's the wrong word, um, encourage it almost, right? Like I, I want it, like there's got to be something that we're falling down on. Like, you know, so it was important for us to sort of really, really like dig below the surface um, on that and, and just, you know, try to make the relationship better. So um, when, when solution providers and um, you know, the, the company on the other side that's needing the solution um, sort of get together. Um, how, do, how do you think, like, what should be, how, how would you necessarily, let's stay with insurance, but it doesn't have to be. If you find, if you think there's another example, let's use that. But how do you, um, from a customer service standpoint and sort of implementation for, to be, make it successful, how do you think about milestones and, you know, um, time wise and, you know, we should be at this particular point. How do you kind of structure that with that company? And, you know, um, I, I'm assuming you're setting, like you're really spending a lot of time setting expectations. Like we will be here at this point and you should be getting this solution. But how do you think about that? And, and as an organization as well. 
Mm -hmm. um, no, you're, you're right. And you have to repeat it 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 on a phone call. And then you have to send an email afterwards because people process data differently, you know, so you, you, you have to repeat it and then you have to repeat it again. Yeah. But setting, you know, the, like the, the project timelines is really critical because it gets everybody on the same page. And I think what's most important in that process is identifying this is what we're going to do for you, but even more so, this is what you are going to do for us. I know in our implementation process, there's a lot of information and things we need from the customer. And we try to let them know that as far in advance as possible and provide documentation. You're going to need your IT teams. Let's start coordinating with them now. Here's the timelines and also letting them know that if we miss this deadline, you know, we build some buffer into our schedules, but we've probably done this and come up with a, a, a you know, a timeline based upon their business needs. Okay. So especially this time of year, there's a lot of people who want stuff done by January one. Now everybody can't have all their projects done at the same time, the last two months of the year, or that's going to be a serious problem. So it's looking at those timelines and trying to understand, what are your business needs? When do you need this by? What do you expect it to do by that date? And then backing out that information and making sure those timelines along the way for both the vendor and the, you know, the customer are very, very clear that you understand what those are and what each is responsible for. Um, and if one of those are missed, which happens a lot actually in the industry, quite surprisingly, it, it happens a ton. Um, you know, you know, someone goes on leave unexpectedly or something mm -hmm. like that, or, you know, a global pandemic hits, you know, weird things like that. Yeah. Um, you have to update and that's where you have to say, now here's how it affected the timelines because this came in a week late. Now this got pushed back two weeks because, you know, the engineer had to work on this and it's communicating. Once again, I'm going to say that again, you know, back to my cheesy communication is everything. It's setting those expectations and, you know, here's what you're responsible for. Here's what we're responsible for. And if there's anything that's changed that it's more phone calls and it's more emails saying the same thing over and over again, just trying to be as completely clear um, as you possibly can. I think we should be completely transparent about it. I think the communication is annoying, but it's respected, right? Like I, 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 that's been my expectations is like when you over communicate, yeah, it, it can get under the skin of people because it's like, oh, another email, another, another meeting. But it's like when, if things go wrong and you haven't communicated, oh, that's like, you know, that's bad. If things go wrong and you've communicated, what happens is, well, you know, you told us, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's not even a CYA thing. It's, I, I feel as though it gets respected. Like, you know, um, Hey, you're, you're really trying to keep us, you know, uh, prevent us from going off the rails. You're trying to make us successful. I feel like it gets respected. Yeah, it does. And, you know, we have to remember this isn't like a, a CYA type of thing at all whatsoever. It's yeah. not like that at all. It's, you know, truly trying to make sure that you can meet your business needs that you told us, you know, that's how we started this conversation that by January one, you needed to be doing X. And I'm telling you that in order to achieve that, we, we need to do this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just got to be communication. And you know what, think back, you know, you say communication, it can get under the skin. It can at times. And you know what? I'll tell you right now, it gets way more under the skin for the person who's saying it more than the person hearing it. Because yeah. by the fourth time you've said it, you're really tired of saying it. But it takes people an average of six to seven times of hearing something today to actually process it. So there's a gap there. How many customers of you or anyone who's listening to this right now, you know, lost or vendors of you lost because you're like, oh, they just over communicated? Zero. Zero, but under communicate just a little bit and it's, and it's insufficient. They, they you disappeared. The project, right. But <laughs> you, it's, you feel like you're over communicating yeah. and sometimes it feels like it can get annoying. But I, I mean, if someone has lost a customer or vendor because they over communicate, there's a difference between like over sharing or TMI. <laughs> That's a different story. Yeah. You don't lose customers over over communicating. Yeah. Okay. And, and I apologize for bouncing around. We're going like in the 5%, outside the 5% <laughs> and, and doing all this. Um, so for those that are new at this, let's say, um, you know, tech founder, right? Uh, she's designed this new thing that could be very useful for a particular industry, but she's, you know, PhD product developer, um, hasn't really had a lot of experience doing that sort of thing. Um, and you come from the tech side. Any, 
I, I have a feeling you might be like, it might be in your DNA, but for someone that's like really focused on, that has been focused on their, you know, the academics and the research of their training, um, what do you suggest for them to sort of uh, train them, teach them? How can they learn um, those critical aspects and get better at it? I think that's where I'm going to go back to the done is better than perfect. Um, it's that there's, you know, the research community really loves, you know, when you look at a, at a curve and it starts, you know, you start get, getting that diminished rate of return, right? You're really approaching that line. A lot of time can be spent in the research world on getting as close to that line as possible. You know, you spent 10% of your time getting 90% of the way there, right? But you're going to spend 90% of your time on the last 10%. That's the research world. That's great. That's how I want my vaccines to work, okay? This makes complete and total sense. There are some things where done is better than perfect. You're going to have to sometimes get it out there or take a first step before you're comfortable with it. You're never going to be able to prove something that it's going to work entirely 100% before. Sometimes you're only going to get to that, I think this is going to be 90% chance that I think this is going to work, or I'm 90% sure that this is going to be what I want it to be. Um, you know, and that, then, that's and then, gotta be and, good then and then communicate that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and I know that can be really, really hard. I think that's been one of the, the biggest stumbling blocks I've seen just throughout my entire career. When I see research, you know, people or former educators move into, you know, a non-research or non-academia kind of world, that is always the biggest stumble. And I could see that happening in business as well. Um, so, you know, make sure you find a, a vendor or partner, you know, someone that you can trust with, communicate, um, you know, and a lot of it goes back to just understanding how people are just fundamentally different. Um, you, are, I don't know if you know anything about like disc assessments or things like that. There's like 8 million different ways that we can profile ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are people that are want the top three bullet points and look at the big picture and like the high level overview. There are some people who won't get a task done unless they have step by step directions and want all of the details. None of those are right or wrong. Both are very essential in this world today, but people are very, very different. And so you've got to be able to recognize, you know, which one are you and which one are, are you working with and try to find that, that balance and communicate <laughs> again. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really, really critical. So um, yeah, that's, that, that'd be the biggest hang up and, and probably the most important for, for yeah, a person in that position. And maybe take a Dale Carnegie course. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but um, I want to talk about something that, um, you know, having been on the other side again, um, that's just so interesting is um, I, that is very surprising to me. And so um, you get solution providers who uh, come in and they give their pitch and their skepticism, 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 then they buy it. And then all of a sudden it's like the Holy Grail. Like it's the, the, and so, um, I'm concerned as someone on the other side that we have an industry that once they're comfortable with it, uh, that Holy grail, they basically run their business on it. And I know for the solution provider, that is awesome. Like that's the position you want to be in. <laughs> I can think of a specific example of, of what you're talking about. You know, um, and so I come from the cat modeling world. And so, you know, at some, it, there was a lot of skepticism with cat models. And now there are like the industry is essentially run by them, you know? And so it's like the number that comes out, that's the number, right? And I, re I remember we were evaluating a new cat model, right? And uh, the new cat model had a different number than the old cat model. And it was just like, why are they wrong? I'm like, why are they wrong? How do you, what if we're wrong? <laughs> like, how are we so sure, you know? And so, um, so that puts you in a tough spot, right? Because that, that's sort of the, tr el the level of trust that you're, you're aiming for. But is, you know, what if it starts to veer off where your solution is being um, kind of funneled into different areas that may not give, it may not have been what it was intended for. It's kind of you're, you know, it's kind of squeezing a little blood out of a stone to try to do it again. Awesome position to be in, but they may get disappointed at some point with the results, even though you love that level of trust. How do you deal with something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you really bring up a phenomenal example with the cat models. Um, the fact that they went from, I mean, and it was over a large period of time, no cat models 
um, you know, and all, all at the um, expertise of an underwriter to look how heavily the cat models are weighed now. Yeah. And we don't even need underwriters. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, yeah. that happened over a 20 year time yeah. period, basically. Yeah. Um, huge evolution. And if you, you listen to the experts, uh, the pendulum swung a little too far. Okay. Yeah. So the pendulum has to swing back again. And this kind of makes me think about another one of, you know, sort of the account management or customer success um, types of things. And that is, satisfaction okay it's it ties back to that if you sell somebody something that they don't need they're going to figure it out eventually and that's not how you're going to retain a customer it's certainly how you're not going to expand so you've you know it's 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 great it's a great position for the vendor to be in or, or you know that's that's awesome um but it if the pendulum swings too far one way it will swing back I don't know when it could be five years, yep. it could be 20 years, but it's going to, because people are going to realize this isn't doing what I thought it was going to do. You know, I can look at small examples of this, where if I've seen a, a product or data purchased or used for a bad you know, reason, you know, meteorological data, I actually see this happen from, from time to time where they want to use, you know, something to, to you know, look at, uh, gosh, I mean, you could pick a ton of meteorological variables, say, look at um, snow depth or something like that. You know, well, it's not very accurate. We're using it to judge this and helping us to underwrite this and all that. But you have to look at the data. And, and I realize from a data perspective that there's some flaws in some of those data sources that you have evaporation and transpiration and things happening. And just so happens to be at a ski resort where they measure it. So they're also mm -hmm. like making snow and grooming and things like that. And so it's like not maybe the greatest of data sources. Um, the satisfaction isn't going to be there. It may feel like it's there for a little while, but you know, data and, and truth is going to prevail in these situations. And eventually they're going to say, actually, this isn't working for us. And you're going to eventually lose the customers. So yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a stable equilibrium system a little bit. You know, if, if you swing too far, it's going to swing back. Okay. Well, um, I want to make sure we give you plenty of time to talk about your, your uh, your book, so I, ha I have it here. <laughs> it's right here. So, oh, uh, damn green screen. It's okay. Here. Oh, there we go. There the we go. The weather story. The weather story with Francis Fox and Francis Fox. Um, this was phenomenal. Really. Thank you. Like, it's um. So for those that are listening, um, highly recommend. It's called the weather story. It's an extremely lyrical, rhythmic. Um, poetry of um, you know teaching children what weather is and um, you know my kids talk about high and lows now um, and so it's it's just the the lyrics of it so um, talk about wh why'd you do it yeah um, it's so cute to hear about your kids oh my goodness anytime it gets kind of cloudy and windy out my daughter runs through the house and she's like low pressures on the way and it's like <laughs> she's three right and like this is this is so amazing yeah. so yeah you know I talked a little bit earlier about how I, I you know kind of have a, a the gift of translating I suppose um, I love translating hard technical concepts in an easy way that someone can understand and my sister-in-law came to me a couple years ago and said my niece was really scared of storms. Um, any advice for her, you know, since you're a meteorologist? I said, oh my gosh, yes. She needs a good book because if there's a fear of something, education in my mind is like the, the place to go. That's the best way to fix it. So I looked and I looked and I looked and there were a million weather books out there, but none of them I would just fit what I was looking for. I wanted to teach her about the weather. I wanted it to be honest and truthful about what lightning and thunder is and thunderstorms and all of that. And I just couldn't find it. And, um, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention, right? So I had this idea in my head and it's like, huh, maybe I could, could write a kid's book about it. So I had the idea in my head for a long time. And one day I finally put the pen to paper and wrote it out. And for me, it was a real high priority that it was nice to read because I have two young kids too. They're two and four. Um, we've read a lot of children's books. <laughs> okay. And I know the ones I really like to read and the ones that I don't, you know, I think of like little blue truck, beautiful to read. Okay. Yeah. It's like rhythmical. Beep, beep, beep. And it's, yeah. Yep. Oh, and it's just beautiful to read. Yes. Like it rolls off the tongue nicely. So I wanted to write a story that was beautiful, but was accurate because so many of the weather books out there today are not, it's, which is actually quite shocking, but they're not written by meteorologists. There's, you know, the wrong words, you know, they talk about water evaporating mm -hmm. and turning to a mist. That's not correct. That's not mist. Water mist is actually water drops, not, you know, evaporating water. So, um, 
I just, I, I did it. It took me about 11 months. I wrote it, um, went back and forth about illustrating, decided to dust off the watercolors and illustrated it. And, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, be beautifully done. I'm tr damn screen here. Come on. But there's the Fox. I mean, you drew this. Beautiful. I did. I, beautifully I can... done. Thank you. And I can, yeah, let's see. I've got, okay. um, so like, you know, high and low pressure, you know, so teaching kids about, you know, it's actually a column of air above us and high pressure means the atmosphere is actually higher above us. There's more air pushing down on you. Low, it's actually shorter and lower. There's less air. And, and what does high and low pressure actually mean for what you're going to be getting? So I wanted it to be accurate. Um, but also really nice to read. So it, it took a long time. It was a true labor of love. Um, and I'm so excited that it's out here and everyone who's seen it so far seems to really enjoy it. And I've had kids and parents of all ages, grandparents say that they learn something while reading it, which is, is really, that's, that's yep. so special to me. Well, I got a treat because, um, our listeners are going to learn something. You brought up rain. So I went to that page. Um, <clears throat> and now you're going to get the, uh, Nick Lamparelli treatment for uh, what this sounds like when I read it to my kids and then we'll sign off. Cloud, <laughs> clouds are made of water drops more than anyone can count. When there are too many to hold, the clouds must dump them out. Then rain falls to the ground and gets everything wet. But if the air is cold enough, snow is what you get. And so um, that's fantastic. I love it. I love it. And thank you so much for coming on and giving us like a, a really um, down to earth perspective on, you know, just the, that relationship, that key relationship between um, solution provider and solution needer. And uh, in case Serena didn't emphasize it enough, the keyword is communication. Did we say communication? I think we may have said it once or twice. Communication. Okay, good. I'll have to do. I'll have to do a, a word count on my transcription. But <laughs> communication is the key. So, as usual, Serena, um, are you going to do another book? Oh, I have. You know, the entrepreneurial mindset. I've got like three more ideas. But I mean, with like two kids and working from home and global pandemic, I think I'm going to take it easy for a little bit and just sort of see how this one does. But I've there's a franchise ideas. here. There's a franchise here. <laughs> Maybe Francis Fox will come back out. People have to go check on Amazon okay. and uh, see if Francis Fox maybe has another adventure coming up. Please, everyone, support Francis Fox. Support Serena. Thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you so for, much. For everyone that's listening, stay safe. Please subscribe. Uh, be kind to you, your neighbors and, and everybody else. Tough world, but just be kind. And uh, Serena, thanks again. Thanks so much. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created in. I have a dream that one day on the red hill. Sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners. Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content.